It's an exciting day today. We are in Washington, D.C., in this place that you may know in person as we begin the second book of Samuel, as we've known many times over the last few weeks. There really isn't a second book of Samuel. Really, it's only one book, Shmuel. But at some point when the Christian fathers made chapters, they also divided the book in two. And it's a fairly simple division because the first book ends, as we saw yesterday, with the death of the first king of Israel, Shaul. I should say the first king of Israel was appointed by God. You may remember back in the book of Shoftim when there was a man named Avimelech who decided that he was king on his own. And so that's where we begin uh, today. Shmuel Bet, Perek Aleph, Vayhi Acharei Mot Shaul, V'david Shav Mehakotet HaMalek, Vayeshev David Betziklag Yamim Shnaim. So after the death of Saul, David had returned. He was, if you remember, he, uh, he was living in the city of Siklag, which was given to him by the king of Gat. And while he was living there, um, and he went out to wage war ostensibly with the rest of the Philistines, he was, his, the city was burned down. David had to go and rescue with the soldiers, all the women and the children. And then they came back. And that's why he's coming back from battling the Amalek. And now he's in Siklag for two days. And on the third day, Vihinei Ish. And on the third day, there is a person ba min ha machane me im shaul uvigadav kru im va damal rosho va ibavo al david va ipol arzavishnah. So on the third day, a person comes out from the battlefield, where and this person's uh, his clothing is torn and he has he has dirt on his head, right? Signs of mourning, and the person falls onto the ground. Va yomer lo david emi zetavo. And David said, well, you know, why are you showing up like this? What is this? And he said, I ran from the Israelite camp. And David said, what was it? And obviously David is no fool. He understands that this person is wearing signs of mourning. It's not going to necessarily be a very good report that that is being given. And David is, to, and he says, Vayomer, Asher nas ha'am min ha'melchama, v'gam harbei nafal min ha'am v'yemutu, v'gam sha'ul v'yihonatan b'no metu. And he said, I ran from the camp. Many people died. There, were, there was devastation. And also Saul and Yonatan, his son, fell. They both, they died. And that reminds us the beginning, if you remember back in the beginning of Shmuel Aleph, when we had the loss of B'nai Israel we talked about a lot yesterday against the Plishtim and Shiloh was destroyed. We had a similar, we had somebody who came back from the battlefield and reported there to Eli HaKohen in a very similar sort of sort of staccato sort of way. This happened and this happened and that happened. And, you know, and also your two sons died. And then Eli, of course, well, he fell over when he heard that the, the ark was taken. Bayomer Hanar HaMagidlo, we're in verse six. And so this young man said to him, Nekro Nekreti Bahar Gilboa. Now he gets into more detail. I was at Har HaGilboa. Bine Shaul Nishan al Khanito and Saul was was right, sort of hanging on his his spear. He was he was uh, sort of impaled already, but not fully. And the chariots and the cavalry were overtaken. We talked about this word davek, like tvekut, being close, you know, uh, in Hasidic literature and mystical literature, being close to God. But it's used here. It's also used back in the book of Shoftim to describe a battle. Right, they are coming close to him. They are cling. They're going to cling to him and take him over. He looked back and he saw me. And he called to me and I said, "Yes, I'm here. What is it?" And he said to me, "Who are you?" And Amaleki Anochi. And I said to him, "I am from Amalek." And obviously, there's a great irony there. Shaul's whole downfall is really around Amalek. Yes, there's the first sin. He doesn't wait for Shmuel. And Shmuel says to him, you know, this was bad, but it's really, he has a chance to revert in the battle of Amalek. He doesn't listen fully to God. So at least in this telling of the story, it has this sad, ironic twist that at the moment of his death, there is somebody from Amalek who is there with him. Bayomer Eli, Amad na Eli umitutaini, and Saul turned to me, the king, he turned to me and he said, 
please, death is seizing me. Please end my life. I know that I'm going to die. Sitting there, you know, think of one of these uh, these movies with one of these, you know, uh, so, you know, warriors, whatever. They got like 12 arrows stuck in them. I don't know if it's that much, but he knows he's going to die. He knows it's going to happen. What we saw in the last chapter, Shaul says, he didn't say it to this Amaleki. There was identified as the arms bear. He said to him, please kill me so the Philistines don't torture me. And we discussed a number of reasons to why that might be. The Amoda love and this young Amaleki who's in mourning said, I stood uh, next to him, the Amotetehu, and I, and I killed him. Or I, I, it doesn't say harag, which means to kill. It's almost like mot, I allowed him to die, right? It's uh, not say Dr. Kevorkian or whatnot, but this is like a physician assisted suicide is taking away somebody who is, who is being tortured. Ki adati ki lo yichia achare niflo. Because I knew he was going to die after what had happened to him. And I took the crown which was on his head. And I took the bracelet from his arm. What did I do? I brought them to you here. I know. This was the former king of Israel, Shaul. Well, it hasn't been publicly stated. We know who's going to be the next king. Everybody knows it's going to be you, David. So here, here is this crown. Here is some sort of bracelet, maybe also signifying the kingdom. What does David do? He tears his clothing. So right, this young Na'ar had his, has his uh, clothing torn and, and ashes, dirt on his, on his head. <coughs> And now David does the same. He tears his clothing. Yes, again, Shaul is the person who's been chasing after him, who wants to kill him. But David, at times, right, Shaul has said, B'ni David, he said it, that those two moments of clarity when he was able to sort of put that hatred and that jealousy behind me, speaks about David as being his son. And so here too, David, in, uh, mirroring it, is tearing his clothing like a relative. And it is his relative. His father-in-law has passed away. <clears throat> the Gam Kalanashima Sherito and everybody else who's with them also tears, rents their clothing by Ispadu, by Ivku, by Atsumu, Ada Arab, Al Shaul, Val Yonatan Beno, Vial Ama, Donai, Val Beit Israel, Kina Flu, Becharev. And they, mm -hmm. they mourn and they eulogize and they don't eat until the evening. For, and there, look how many things for Saul, who has died, and Jonathan, his son, who has died, right? David's best friend, who he has this pact with. And for the nation of God, for the Israelites, and for the house of Israel who it all has fallen in it by the sword, all has fallen in battle. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And again, I'll repeat what I said yesterday, but really it, it, it's it's important to say, it's like all of Shmuel Aleph, all of the great success of the prophet Shmuel, all the great battles that were won by Shaul have all gone to now. We're back to the place where we were with the Philistines, the Plishtim defeating the Israelites in battle. We're continuing in verse 13. By Omer David al-Nara Magidlo, Amy Zata. And David says to this young man, who, who are you? And he says, I'm the son of an Amalek. And I know we think of Ger as a convert, and the Tanakh Ger does not mean a convert, means a stranger. Right, I'm from the Amalekites, but we've been, you know, living here amongst the Israelites. We're, we're, we're part of your society. said, how could you have the chutzpah, the nerve? Why, weren't you scared? to kill the anointed one of God. And we saw this multiple times from David, that David said over and over again that he would not be the one. He said to Saul, God's going to make sure you die. I'm not going to be the person to do it. So how could this person have the nerve to do it? David says to one of the uh, young men, go and kill this person. And he dies. loved David, And David says to him, Damchal Roshecha, your blood is on your head, meaning you are responsible. Because you said that you killed the anointed one of God. And it's interesting here, we have two different, I was sort of alluding to this earlier, we have two different um, sort of stories. In the first story, it's the arms bearer of Saul, the one that's told in the last chapter. And we believe that's the real story because that's what's told to us by the narrator of this book. And in this chapter, what do we have? We don't have the narrator of the book. What we have instead is we have the report from this young man who, who it certainly seems and wouldn't be, is trying to curry favor with David. Here's, here, future king is your crown. Here, future king is your bracelet. By the way, 
I was the one who, you know, got rid of the guy, finished off the guy who was trying to kill you. He thought that David would respond in a very positive fashion, that maybe this guy would be getting, you know, some some advantages. But that's not what the way that David sees it. And you can look at things right, both from a, a, a sense of well, we don't see David loving people. Everybody loves David. Michal loves David. Um, right. Uh, Shaul early in his life loves David. Uh, Yehonatan loves David. We don't see David loving other people. So David loves God. We don't see David loving other people. Everybody's love is granted to David, not away from David. But in this uh, in this instant, he shows, you could say, great respect for Shaul, great respect for Yonatan, and he's broken up about it. You can also look at it from a political standpoint. I'm the next one who's going to be king. I have to be very careful in the way that people treat kings. Right. It's, oh, it's, a, it's a good protection policy as well. I'm not saying that, you know, it was only those sort of subversive and uh, uh, um, thoughts. That's why David um, killed this person. I think there's more to it than that, but it's hard to separate the two. And now David offers a lament. And there's some of these parts of this lament will be familiar with some of these phrases and some of these words. And David now laments. Right. We know the book of Echa, the, uh, the book that's read on Tisha B'av about the destruction of Jerusalem, the ancient name for it is Kinot, Lamentations, it's called. And there are other places where we have keynotes. And so here is one of the first keynotes, as far as we know, written by David on the death of Shaul and Yonatan. Vayomer, Lamed b'nei Yehuda Kesha. And David said, and this is his dirge, we must teach the children of Judah, the archer's bow, right? How to use their, their bows and arrows. Hinech Tuval Sefer Yashar. It's written on the book of uprightness on the book that is yashar that is straight hatsvi israel alba motecha halal eich naflu giborim oh the glory of israel you were slain in your heights how the mighty have fallen that's a, a beautiful description we know that phrase eich naflu giborim how have the mighty fallen how could such a thing happen al tigidu vigat al tibasru bechumsot ashkelon pentis hamachna benot plishtim penta alozna benot haarelim he says, right, don't tell them in God. And David is aligned at this point with the king of God. That's the one who gave him Siklag. That's the one who's been the beneficiary of David's uh, raids and wars. And that's who's given him protection. But he says, don't go tell it in God. Don't spread tidings in Ashkelon. We know Ashkelon is a city in Israel today. Then it was one of the five cities of the Philistines. We don't want the Philistine girls to rejoice. We don't want their daughters of the uncircumcised, right, over and over again. The pejorative term, we've said it many times, for the Philistines in this book is their are limb. They are uncircumcised. And, you know, I think it's it's not just saying, oh, technically they didn't have circumcision. It's also sort of saying they're barbarians. Continuing in 21. Hare begilboa al tal al matar alechem ustei trumot kisham negal magain giborim magain sha'ul beli mashiach bashamen. Oh, mountains of Gilboa, their due nor rain will be upon you, right? Everybody should be mourning. We shouldn't have due and rain. It shouldn't be normal. There shouldn't be fields of bounty because, right, Saul and Yonatan with their mighty swords, the anointed ones, have been rejected. The, the, the blood of those who were slain, the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan, the sword of Shaul will not return empty, right? I will, there will be revenge for them. And look at verse 23, and I think this is the one that more than anything sort of expresses the, the love that, that, that uh, David has, Shaul v'yonatan. We know that that phrase, those last few words, of course. He says, Saul and Yonatan, beloved and pleasant in their life and in their death not parted, right? They were together. They were such a strong relationship. We know, of course, Shaul did everything to try to ensure that his son would be king rather than his son-in-law David. And right, and they were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. We know that, of course, that that phrase. Interesting here that David uses the word ni'im, pleasant. David is oftentimes re referred to as one of sort of his quote unquote nicknames as ni'im's mirot Israel, the sweet singer of Israel. David uses that phrase here, ni'im, in what might be our first sort of poem or dirge or however we want to put it that we see um, composed by David. Benot Yisrael, we're in verse 24. El Shaul be. The daughters of Israel, they weep over Saul. 
right? The ones who would usually clothe themselves in scarlet and beautiful colors and have golden jewelry upon their clothing. Eich naflu giborim, right? He says, again, how, the, how could the mighty have fallen? Betoch ha-melchama, Yehonatan al bamotecha chalal. Jonathan slain upon your heights. And obviously, you know, there's more. He's upset about Shaul, but really, Yehonatan was David's best buddy, their pact that they have. I am distressed over you, my brother Jonathan. Right? You were so, you were Ni'im, you were so pleasant, you were so kind. Remember, Yonatan, at his own peril, Yonatan is supposed to be the next king, saves the life of David, warns him, gives him signals, tells David to run away in the chapter with his arrow, with he shooting the arrows and tells the young boy to go this way, to, to point to David whether he has to run away or not. Your love of me was greater than a love of a, of a woman. So great was our love. So strong was that connection. Right? In the Torah, we know man and woman fit together when man doesn't have a partner and God ain't it. God says, right, make a woman for him. So they fit together. This is who they're supposed to be as partners. And David saying, Yonatan, you gave me something even greater than that. That's what our relationship was. Eich naflu giborim. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war gone to waste. And we know the only ones who really had weapons of war, it was said in earlier chapters, were Shaul and Yonatan. The Jews had less technology. They didn't have, they were unable to make weapons. If they wanted to, to uh, sharpen their swords, they had to go to the Philistines. And the Philistines weren't doing that to their enemies. They weren't, you know, oh, let me take your spear and make it really sharp. So when you throw it at me, I'm going to die. And so, right, these are the only people who have this clay mil chama, literally. And I think it also means them as being sort of the, the, uh, the kalim of God. They are the vessels of God to wage war, to lead B'nai Israel in battle, to bring glory to B'nai Israel. And of course, the end of this chapter with the destruction, with their death, is demonstrating that anything but a glory has come to Israel. And 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 David here is, is broken up. And again, I, I come back and it's hard to separate the two. It's I know it's kind of Machiavellian and, you know, it doesn't make David always look good. Uh, we have to look at this on the one hand of David saying, this is the future king. I'm going to, this is the king. I'm going to be the king in the future. And he's very, very, you know, you have to be very careful about how you kill the king. But I think in addition to that, there is a tremendous amount of emotion here. We see that David refuses to kill um, Shaul, despite the fact that it would have been beneficial to him, and obviously extremely broken up about Yehonatan. And now the question is here, now that they are gone, what's going to happen? Is it going to be smooth sailing for David to become the next king of Israel or not? How is that going to happen? We'll see that over the next number of chapters.